so welcome students in the class of analog and digital communication subject uh, in the last class we had talked about uh, the demodulation of uh, fm signal so today we will continue with that discussion and uh, we had uh, discussed the demodulation of fm with the help of foster sealed discriminator in the last class so in today's class firstly i'll hurriedly uh, revise again uh, the working of foster sealed discriminator and then we will continue forward so this was our foster sealed discriminator another name for foster sealed discriminator i told you it is a phase discriminator and uh, uh, here uh, if i tell you that uh, we were using uh, two diodes okay and uh, we had a primary of the transformer where we applied the input signal v12 then we had center tapped secondary okay and the voltage across the secondary was indicated by the terminals a and b and our output voltage was taken across a v a dash b dash fine so here the because the analysis of foster sealed discriminator was a bit involving one or bit lengthy so i'll not go into much details uh, in today's class as we have already covered but i would like to again revise so that we can correlate our discussion of today's topic with uh, what we did in the uh, previous class so uh, here students in foster sealed discriminator we had included an inductor in the uh, secondary part of uh, the circuit and the voltage across the inductor uh, was indicated as vl and uh, we had proved that the voltage across inductor in the secondary was approximately equal to the input voltage okay so our input voltage or input signal was v12 and this v12 is appearing across this inductor that is l3 so this was our first part of the analysis where we wanted to prove that the uh, inductor is uh, providing us uh, the equivalent of the input voltage fine next so after we had proved that we have vl sorry v12 across this inductor now our objective is to find out the voltage in the secondary circuit that is vab this we wanted to prove okay and uh, so we are obtaining voltage across the secondary winding and we are calling it as vab okay so uh, from the figure we had derived that this voltage vab was equal to this one it was a complex value j is a complex then uh, m was our mutual inductance l1 is the inductance of the primary circuit v12 is our input voltage xc2 is the capacitive reactance of the secondary capacitor and this r2 plus jx2 is the impedance of your secondary coil fine and x2 was equal to xl2 minus xc2 okay so xl2 is the uh, reactance of uh, inductor uh, secondary coil and uh, xc2 is the reactance of the capacitor in the secondary circuit okay so first we have uh, obtained vl uh, that is voltage across l3 that has been uh, found to be equal to v12 and now we are trying to find the expression for vab that is voltage across the secondary so if we move forward this is the same expression that i showed you in the uh, previous slide now why are we doing this why are we trying to find out the voltage across l3 and the voltage across the secondary our objective is to find out the voltage that has been applied across diode d1 and d2 respectively so if you carefully look at diode d1 so in the parallel of d1 we have l3 and we have the half portion of the secondary okay so that's why uh, we want to obtain the voltage that we are applying across d1 and d2 respectively okay now see 
this is what we are doing we are finding out the voltage across d1 and d2 the voltage across d1 is vao okay voltage across d2 is vbo fine so what is vao and bo c this is a and this is o okay so this is the voltage across d1 okay and this is the voltage across d2 vbo so what is vao vao is voltage across secondary plus the voltage across coil l3 okay similarly the voltage uh, across d2 is voltage across the secondary plus the voltage across l3 okay obviously sign will matter so if you can see because it is the center tapped uh, transformer uh, secondary so what will be the polarity will have plus minus plus minus like this so uh, and this is your vl or v12 so across d1 the voltage that is applied is vl okay plus vac okay what is vac half secondary fine so vl is this inductor voltage so what we have voltage across d1 is v12 input voltage plus half of secondary voltage because we have center tap transformer so secondary voltage uh, yeah, induced is divided into two equal parts so that's why it is taken half of vab now voltage across d2 that is vbo that is v12 minus half of vab okay and uh, why we have minus because of the center tap we have a minus sign here so what i am trying to say here is that the voltage across d1 which is applied to d1 it is vl that is nothing but v12 plus half of vab okay and the voltage across d2 it is nothing but v12 minus half of vab okay so uh, i think you are able to understand this now what we want to do we want to find out obviously the output voltage okay our output voltage is this one va dash b dash we take output from here okay so obviously this output voltage it should give us our uh, demodulated signal so this output voltage v a dash b dash now you see here since if you look carefully at the d1 and d2 directions the current flowing through d1 will be in this direction and current flowing through d2 will be in the upward direction that means the voltages induced by d1 and uh, d2 currents they will Uh, be one eighty degree out of uh, you can say sign there, or you can say the two voltages will opposite e each other. Okay, so it means the V A dash B dash will be the difference of the two voltages which are appearing across these two capacitors. Okay, and uh, so V A dash B dash will be equal to V A dash O minus V B dash O. okay and we know that this va dash o and the drop across d1 okay so if we neglect the drop across the diodes d1 and d2 we can say that this output voltage va dash b dash is proportional to the difference of the two voltages that is vao and vbo and what is vao vao is voltage across d1 and vbo is the voltage across d2 so what i want to say here directly that the output voltage va dash b dash is proportional to the difference of the two voltages which is appearing across d1 and d2 respectively that's it okay so uh, this is what i want to uh, explain here fine so we have to now find out uh vao and vbo and vao is sum of v12 and v half of vab and vbo is the difference of v12 and half of vab okay v12 is straight forward it is the input voltage now we need to again look at vab so i told you that our v vab expression is like this okay so uh, here uh, sorry not this one the above one this is vab now here 
this VAB will give us three different kind of results depending on uh, whether uh, what is our input uh, frequency. Okay, so um, see here your x2, this is r2 plus jx2, and your x2 is nothing but xl2 minus xc2. Okay, so now what will happen uh, when our input frequency is fc means the signal which is coming at the primary, it is having the same frequency as the carrier frequency. In that case, your xl2 will be equal to xc2. This means x2 will be zero. So if x2 is zero, we are left with this one. And uh, it means this is uh, purely an imaginary number. And you can express this purely imaginary number in terms of phasor like this, that this is your magnitude part and this is your phase part. So J is replaced by angle 90, you all know that. Okay, so in the first case, when your input frequency is FC, when your X2 will be zero, your VAB is 90 degree out of phase. It is having 90 degree phase, okay? So now let us observe all these things vectorially. See, this is what I wanted to represent. So what is VAO? VAO is V12 plus half of VAB. Okay, see, this V12 is shown in the form of vector. Half of VAB is also shown in the form of vector. And why are we showing it as uh, half of VAB is 90 degree out of phase with respect to V12? If we go back, you see here, VAB is 90 degree out of phase with respect to V12. Okay, so half of VAB will also be 90 degree out of phase. That's why this half of VAB has been shown with the phase 90. And minus half of VAB will be just opposite of half of VAB. So this is minus half of VAB. So this is our VAO, vectorial sum of V12 and half of VAB. Then what is VBO? I told you VBO will be V12, vectorial sum of V12 and minus half VAB. So this is the vectorial sum of this. So this is our VAO, this is our VBO. So what we have done, we have obtained VAO and we have obtained VBO. And why are we doing that? Because we want to obtain output voltage and your output voltage is proportional to the difference of VAO and VBO. See, so this is our VAO. This is our VAO, this is our VBO. The difference of these two, if you look at this figure, the vectorial uh, vector of VAO and vector of B, VBO both are equal. So it means if you take the difference of this and this, it will come out to be zero. This is the case when your input uh, signal frequency is equal to carrier frequency. Okay, this is point number one. Second point is if my input uh, signal frequency is greater than carrier frequency, then what will happen? So if it is greater than FC, now let us again analyze VAB. This is the original expression. So if we express it in general way, vectorially using uh, magnitude phase uh, representation. So uh, we have J here, J will be replaced with angle 90. Okay, R2, Jx2, it can be represented as mode of Z2, angle theta. Okay, and we know that if we have angle in numerator and denominator, they are subtracted. So what we are left with, rest of the things are same, V12, Xc2, M by L1, Z2. And this is angle of 90 minus theta. Okay, this is the general expression. Now, see, when F in is higher than FC. Okay, so when F in is uh, higher than FC, then we will have less than 90 degree out of phase. Okay, so you see here this one. This phase angle is 90 minus theta means less than 90 degree. Okay, so if you have this less than 90 degree out of phase when F in is uh, higher than uh, uh, FC, then what happens? See, 
this phase of V A B is less than 90. So this is what we get. And if you take the vectorial sum, your V A O has a longer length. Okay, then opposite of half of V A will be this one. If you take resultant of this, that is V B O, resultant of V 1, 2 and this, it will be having a shorter length or sh smaller magnitude. So if you subtract V A O and V B O, obviously net result will be what? Positive, means some positive voltage will come when F in is higher than F C. Okay, this is second case. Fine, now in the third case, what will happen? See, uh, why are we getting this uh, uh, in generalized theta? What is X2? X2 is XL2 minus XC2. Okay, and we all know that your XL2 is nothing but your omega L and your XC2 is one by omega C. Okay, so it means when uh, your input frequency is uh, uh, higher then this uh, omega will be uh, having a higher value. So this will be, uh, uh, you know, uh, net, net positive value. This will be net positive value. If uh, th this uh, at resonance, both are equal. Okay, when Fn is higher than Fc, then this will be higher, this will be smaller. So net, net positive value will be there. That's why we have uh, uh, this theta will be positive. Okay, so net result will 90 minus theta. And when your uh, input frequency is less, then this will become smaller and this will become greater. Okay, in that case, what will happen? You will have Z2 of minus theta in the denominator. And if you have minus theta in the denominator, when you finally solve it in the phasor, you'll get 90 plus theta. That means your uh, phase uh, difference between V12 and half of VA will be 90 plus theta. And the resultant of these two, that is VAO, will be having a smaller value. And if you take opposite of half of VAB, this is what we have then V12, if you take their vectorial sum, you get VBO, which is having larger magnitude. So if you take the difference of VAO and VBO, it will be minus. So this is how by observing the output voltage, we can easily distinguish whether uh, my input signal frequency is equal to carrier frequency, it is higher than carrier frequency or less than carrier frequency. This is what we wanted to uh, have uh, we wanted to demodulate our frequency changes into the uh, voltage changes. So uh, this is the main uh, operation of your foster CLA discriminator. Fine. Next. So next uh, circuit is ratio detector. See, I told you that uh, the main advantage that we had in our foster CLA discriminator was that your primary and your secondary coils, they were tuned to a single frequency. There was no requirement of uh, tuning uh, to the, you know, different frequencies. But in the foster silly discriminator, we could not provide amplitude limiting. See students, I told you that amplitude limiting is very, very important in case of frequency modulation. We know that our information is contained in the uh, frequency part. Okay, so amplitude of the carrier uh, it remains constant. So because of noise, if there are some changes in the amplitude of the carrier, then by using uh, amplitude limiter, this amplitude changes can be easily removed. Okay, so in case of foster silly discriminator, we had to use amplitude limiter separately because it itself doesn't provide amplitude limiting. Okay, but in case of ratio detector, which is the circuit that we are just going to discuss, the amplitude limiting part is included in this circuit only. Okay, so uh, the ratio detector circuit is a modified version of foster silly discriminator circuit with one additional advantage of amplitude limiting. Means if there are some amplitude variations in the uh, received signal, those amplitude variations can be easily removed in case of uh, ratio detector. Okay. So here, uh, what we have done in this ratio detector circuit 
it is quite uh, visible that the diode D1, it is in the same direction, but the direction of the diode D2, it has been reversed. As if you compare to the Foster Sillet discriminator circuit, see your D1 and D2 had the same direction, whereas in case of ratio detector, they have reverse direction. This is one change that we have introduced here. Another change that has been introduced that we have uh, included a capacitor C5 at the output, which is having a large value. Okay, so this large value capacitor C5 is, has been included here. Okay, so uh, see, we have changed this, you can say orientation of the components in the circuit. So obviously, in case of Foster Sillet discriminator, your output voltage was taken from V A dash B dash. Okay, whereas since we have changed the circuit, we will have to see whether we will be able to get the output from this or we'll have to uh, get the output from some other terminals. So let me tell you that we will have to take the output from some other, you know, terminals. And why is it so? If you look at the circuit carefully, the current which will pass through this diode, it will be in this direction. And the current which will pass through direction uh, diode D2 will also be in the same direction. In case of Foster Sillet discriminator, the, the two outputs of the uh, diodes, they were in the opposite direction. Okay, their voltages were subtracted at the output. And uh, this is uh, what we had proved here in this slide. Whereas by changing the direction of diode D2, now both the diodes, they are providing the positive voltage that is V A dash O is also in the same direction and V B dash O is also in the same direction means this voltage at the output of these two capacitor, it is the sum of the voltage across your R3, R4 or C3, C4. Whereas what we want, we want our output voltage, we want our output voltage to be the subtraction of these two voltages. It means by taking output directly the way we had taken in Foster Sillet discriminator, it will not work here. Okay, so this is what we have to uh, consider here uh, in this uh, ratio detector circuit. See, these two voltages are in the same direction, so they will be added, but we want the subtracted output voltage. Okay, so if you look at the circuit carefully, your output voltage V naught has been taken across these two terminals. This terminal and this terminal. So your output voltage has been taken here. And we will prove this, that this voltage V naught is uh, again uh, the difference of the two voltages as we had proved in the Foster Sillet discriminator. Okay, so uh, let us uh, do that. So after looking at these changes in the ratio detector circuit, now we uh, look into its working. So as I told you that V A dash B dash is now a sum voltage. That is some of the two voltages across these two capacitor, okay, rather than difference voltage. But we want our output voltage to be a difference voltage. So we will take the output voltage from two different terminals that is O and O dash that I told you in the previous slide. So this is our O terminal and this is our O dash and your output is taken across these two terminals and where O is grounded. So we have uh, grounded this part. Another thing is we have taken the two resistances R5 and R6 to be equal. So this R5 and R6, they are taken to be equal resistances. Okay, and uh, as I told you that we need to prove that our output voltage at the new terminals, it is proportional to the difference of the voltages from individual diodes. This is what we had proved in the Foster Sillet discriminator, that is voltage across diode D1 and the voltage across diode D2, uh, they uh, provided us the difference voltage or output voltage was the difference of the voltages across the diode. Same thing we have to prove here. So uh, this is uh, what has been shown in the analysis on the right hand side of the slide. So if you look at uh, the circuit uh, again carefully, see your V naught is equal to 
your v b dash o dash minus v b dash o okay this is what i want if you apply kvl here so you can see that this v not will be equal to the difference of the voltage across r6 that is v b dash o dash and the voltage across c4 that is v b dash o so this is very straightforward okay so this is our v not and we know that this v b dash o dash what is this this is v b dash o dash which is nothing but the one half voltage one by two of the total voltage that is v a dash b dash because these capacitors these resistance they are equal and the voltage uh, that has come from the secondary it has been divided equally in the two parts of the circuit so this v b dash o dash is nothing but half of v a dash b dash okay now what is v a dash b dash so our v a dash b dash that is this v a dash b dash this is equal to v a dash o plus v b dash o divided by 2 see i told you that what is happening here in uh, ratio detector this voltage and this voltage they are adding together okay and this being symmetrical components so the total voltage uh, this uh, v a dash b dash is nothing but v a dash o plus v b dash o so we have substituted this thing here so we get v a dash o plus v b dash o by 2 minus v b dash o so if you solve it further you get output voltage v not equal to v a dash o minus v b dash o by 2 this is nothing but your v not is proportional to your v a dash o Minus V B dash O, and what is V B dash A dash O? Voltage across diode D one, and V B dash O is voltage across diode D two. So by changing the output terminals, we have uh, found such terminals which are giving us again the difference of the voltages across the diode. Okay, so. Um, once we have proved that v not is equal to this so same uh, logic applies to the working of this circuit as we have seen in the uh, foster sillet discriminator that your output voltage uh, will depend on the frequency changes whether your input signal frequency is equal to carrier frequency higher than carrier frequency and your less than carrier frequency so that we have already seen okay so this is one part we have proved that our output voltage is uh, of the same nature as it was in the foster sillet discriminator now we are left with only one point that point is that how our ratio detector circuit provides the amplitude limiting this is very very important so let us see that what is uh, the how does amplitude limiting work basically what we want in the fm we want our carrier to be constant fine carrier amplitude to be constant so obviously that any change in the carrier voltage or carrier amplitude any change in that amplitude it should be opposed okay so if the voltage of the amplitude or the amplitude of the carrier tries to increase it should be opposed if it tries to decrease it should be opposed so that we are able to maintain a constant amplitude of the carrier signal this is what we want so we have taken one case here that how if our input voltage amplitude increases then our circuit of ratio detector should oppose that okay let us see how do we do that so though i have explained clearly in this slide so first if our input voltage v12 increases or it tries to increase so obviously your v12 it tries to increase and uh, since your voltage is induced from primary to secondary obviously uh, your secondary voltage will also try to increase okay then what we have done in ratio detector we have included a very large capacitor in our uh, secondary circuit and we know that your capacitor opposes any change in the increase in the voltage or decrease in the voltage fine so if our input voltage tries to increase and obviously if it tries to 
induce the increased voltage changes in the secondary then our c5 capacitor will oppose that increase in the output voltage okay so your output voltage for the time being is not increased it is maintained constant because of the capacitor but because of the increase in the voltage current is bound to increase okay so though capacitor did not allow the voltage to increase but current in the diodes it has increased okay and because of capacitor our output voltage v not remains unchanged so what is z that is impedance z is equal to v upon i so what is happening our output voltage it is maintained constant because of capacitor but your current has increased so if it is constant and current has increased your impedance it has to come down okay because the denominator is increasing so what happens our load impedance of the circuit it tries to decrease and if the load impedance tries to decrease it will put more pressure on the secondary coil okay more pressure it means technically we should say that the secondary coil of the circuit it damps heavily damping of the coil uh, is uh, you know uh, taking place okay and because of that the quality factor q it comes down okay and as the q comes down then the gain of the amplifier obviously we we have an amplifier which drives this ratio detector circuit the gain of the amplifier comes down and obviously if gain comes down and the gain of the amplifier is driving this uh, uh, ratio detector obviously due to decrease in the gain air input voltage will you know uh, uh, try to decrease okay so in a way whenever input voltage try to increase then your gain of the amplified driving ratio detector it falls and the vice versa takes place if your v12 tries to decrease so if v12 tries to decrease then what will happen if it decreases then obviously it will try to decrease the voltage here but capacitor does not allow to decrease the voltage okay but the current has decreased so again our impedance is equal to v not upon i so our v not will remain constant because of the capacitor but the current has decreased across the diode if current has decreased and this is constant obviously your impedance will increase load impedance will increase okay so if load impedance increases then damping will reduce or you can say q will increase if q increases then the gain of the amplifier increases and this gain of the amplifier increases means whatever reduction in v12 is trying to take place that will be make up by increase in the gain of the amplifier okay this is how our ratio detector circuit provides the amplitude limiting it doesn't allow the amplitude to go down it doesn't allow the amplitude to increase also okay so uh, this was the main uh, you know drawback in foster sillet discriminator that we could not provide amplitude limiting and that amplitude limiting has been now incorporated in the ratio detector circuit so students uh, this is all about the working or the operation of the uh, ratio detector circuit i hope uh, all of you have uh, understood this fine next our next circuit is fm demodulation using pll pll means phase locked loop okay uh if you remember something of this sort we also have seen in uh, our amplitude uh, demodulation also but uh, uh, i hope you have heard this uh, word pll phase locked loop it is a loop circuit means it is a feedback circuit 
okay phase logged means phase has been logged okay means the phase of the two signals they are in synchronous with each other okay so this circuit uh, here we are using this phase logged loop circuit to demodulate fm signal fine so what do we have in this uh, uh, phase logged loop circuit or fm demodulation using pll let us now see so uh, if i try to explain you in simple terms you carefully look at the circuit of pll okay so what is happening here our fm signal is coming from one side okay and uh, we have a vco vco is nothing but voltage controlled oscillator okay voltage controlled oscillator means that kind of oscillator that will give us output signal uh, or you can say output frequency or whose frequency can be controlled through voltage okay so this voltage controlled oscillator will generate some frequency okay and uh, in the beginning we will take that frequency of vco as carrier frequency equal to fc fine so what we are trying to do here that from one side we are obtaining carrier frequency through voltage controlled oscillator from another side we are obtaining fm uh, signal frequency and what is fm signal frequency it is carrier signal frequency plus some frequency deviation so what we have we have carrier frequency plus frequency deviation and we have carrier frequency okay so in case of your pll we have a phase detector block that phase detector block is nothing but a multiplier okay this is the multiplier if you remember i had explained you a term mixer your multiplier is also a mixer and i told you that what is the job of mixer or multiplier it mixes the two frequencies okay it generates the sum frequency okay say f in plus fc this is your sum frequency it also generates the difference frequency that is f in minus fc so this phase detector is nothing but a multiplier which gives us the sum of the two input frequencies and the difference of the two input frequencies this is what we get and fc plus delta f is nothing but your f in so we get f in plus fc and f in minus fc okay so if you look at this thing carefully your f in plus fc is some high frequency which can be you know rejected through a filter okay we are using a low pass filter obviously which will allow low frequencies to pass through and it will reject the high frequency so at the output of the mixer or multiplier the sum of t frequency two frequencies it will be rejected and we will allow this f in minus fc to pass through and what is f in minus fc your f in is fc plus delta f and fc is the carrier frequency if you subtract these two what do you get you get the frequency deviation that is delta f which is nothing but your frequency deviation that is fd and this frequency deviation is proportional to nothing but your modulating signal okay and this is what we want in the demodulation we wanted our demodulated signal back so this is what we have done once we have obtained our things uh, through low pass filter your f in plus fc has been rejected f in minus fc is nothing but your frequency deviation okay so at the output of low pass filter we get the demodulated output which is proportional to nothing but your frequency deviation which is proportional to your modulating signal voltage okay so this is how uh, we generate a low frequency output voltage which is a function of phase difference or you can say frequencies between the two input signal we know phase and frequency they are related with each other okay
fine so this is the main you know crux of uh, uh, this uh, uh, working of uh, uh, this multiplier or uh, you can say phase detector circuit or a mixer circuit uh, that how do we generate demodulated signal back so if we go in some more detail uh, in order to distinguish it from uh, whatever we have discussed till now uh, let me explain one or two more points first point is how did we get this sum frequency and difference frequency if you remember multiplier multiplies two frequencies or two signals say uh, if we have one uh, frequency is represented by say sin a and another is say for example cos b if we have sin a cos b trigonometrically you know that you can multiply by 2 and divide by 2 okay and if you solve this 2 sin a cos b okay you get uh, uh, your uh, uh, sin of a plus b uh, plus minus sin of a minus b your a plus b and a minus b are nothing but the sum frequencies and the difference frequencies okay so um, this is how we get the sum and difference frequency now if we move forward i have written here that when the loop is in lock see what we want one thing students you need to uh, take care of here that I told you that your incoming signal frequency is Fc plus delta F. Fc is the carrier frequency. Okay. And this is also the carrier frequency which we are generating with the help of VCO, that is voltage controlled oscillator. Here, the frequency, carrier frequency that we are receiving from the input side, it is the original carrier frequency. This carrier frequency is the frequency that we have generated at the receiver side. Though the value of these two frequencies, Fc, they are same, their value are same, but unless we are able to match their phase, we will not be able to subtract them. Okay, I hope you are able to understand. See, what we have, we have a frequency Fc. This is also frequency Fc. Okay, and this is also a frequency fc this is also frequency fc now where is the difference both are same frequencies but their phases are different so unless you match their phases you cannot subtract them that is the you know uh, very very important thing that you need to understand that's why we are saying it is phase logged loop because these FCs are generated from two different sources. This FC is coming from transmitter. This FC has been generated by the uh, receiver through VCO, voltage controlled oscillator. So that's why before this PLL circuit starts working, we have to lock the phase of the two input frequencies. Okay, and once it is logged, only then your fm demodulation will be obtained okay so that's why in the initial uh, uh, phase of uh, this uh, uh, demodulation using pll uh, some time is spent on matching the phase of the two signals okay so uh, if you look at this thing again carefully that the output of this phase detector is nothing but Difference signal. Difference signal is nothing but some error signal. Okay. So in the tracking part or in the locking part, initially uh, we'll have to make this error signal zero so that phase is logged and only after that we will be able to detect the signal back. Okay. So finally, uh, when the loop is in lock, your voltage controlled oscillator frequency, it follows the incoming signal frequency. Then we will say that the two things are logged. We will assume that instead of FM wave, only the carrier frequency is coming. So if this is FC, this is also FC, it will give zero output when their phases are matched. That is called locking. So if that has been obtained, then FM wave will be supplied. 
So then in FM, we have FC plus delta F. Obviously, the difference of the two, okay, so that will give us some correction voltage, some DC correction voltage, okay. So this DC correction voltage, this is our voltage controlled oscillator. So this DC correction voltage will be fed to the VCO, okay, that will help us in generating this frequency and we will get the demodulated signal back like this. Okay, so this DC correction voltage fed to VCO, this DC correction voltage fed to VCO is proportional to frequency deviation. Okay, as I explained here. And uh, obviously, since this voltage is proportional to frequency deviation, so obviously this voltage is nothing but the demodulated information signal. Fine. So I hope uh, all of you have been able to understand uh, the operation of this uh, uh, phase locked loop for demodulation of your PLL. So after this uh, main concept of FM demodulation using PLL, we try to look at a few mathematical expression also that will further clarify our understanding. So again, the same thing. So here, uh, the instantaneous frequency of FM wave, that is this one, is your carrier frequency plus the frequency deviation and we all know this frequency deviation is proportional to your modulating signal and k is the proportionality constant fine then uh, the instantaneous frequency of the vco means the this frequency this instantaneous frequency is equal to f naught which is nothing but the free running frequency obviously we will make this free running frequency equal to carrier frequency so since this is also uh, a voltage controlled oscillator uh, means uh, it will give us uh, frequency depending on the uh, voltage then this fvco is also equal to some carrier frequency plus uh, it is proportional to correction voltage this vct is the correction voltage which you apply to this vco okay and k is the proportionality constant okay then as i told you that if we want uh, that this VCO is able to track the frequency changes in this FM wave, then uh, uh, what we want that the frequency of the VCO, it should be equal to the incoming frequency. So the frequency of this incoming signal is FI. Okay. And the frequency of, from here is FVCO. So for proper tracking, we want these two frequencies to be equal. So if we make them equal and we substitute these two expressions from above, what do we get? This equal to this, fine. And uh, if we say VCT is nothing but your correction voltage. Correction voltage, which is applied to this VCO. This is the correction voltage, VCT. Okay, so this VCT is equal to mathematically, you can easily see that this is FC minus F naught plus this one. KFM, which is proportionality constant, MT is your modulating signal. This KVCO is again some proportionality constant. Okay, and I told you that your VCO will be tuned when your free running frequency will be equal to carrier frequency means this FC minus F naught, it will be zero. So if you make this as zero, what we are left with, that is VCT equal to this. What is VCT? Correction voltage. Okay. And this correction voltage, it is proportional to what? Your modulating signal, which is nothing but your demodulated signal. So your correction voltage, VCT, correction voltage, nothing but the error voltage. It is proportional to your information signal that is empty. So when your correction voltage, this correction voltage is nothing but it is only going at the output as demodulated signal. So this correction voltage, it is proportional to your modulating signal or the demodulated signal when uh, the VCO will be tuned like this. So this is again, 
some mathematically uh, proved expression that further strengthens our understanding uh, regarding the demodulation of fm using pll so you can see here the control voltage or the correction voltage to vco it is proportional to mt which is nothing but the modulating voltage hence the demodulated voltage is nothing but the control voltage you can see here that the voltage that we get here that is our demodulating voltage the voltage that we get here that is also the correcting voltage or the control voltage okay so once it is logged the circuit in itself in the loop through feedback will be able to provide us uh, the demodulated signal out of our fm signal so i hope uh, you are clear about the concept of fm demodulation using pll next so uh, this is all about our demodulators for uh, fm okay now we need to hurriedly compare uh, various fm demodulators though we have uh, seen their uh, comparison or seen their advantages or disadvantages while discussing each one of them so first we saw slope detectors those slope detectors they were inefficient they had very limited linear range they were sensitive to amplitude changes uh, they were difficult to tune because we had to tune them to many frequencies so practically these slope detectors they are not used anywhere in practice then we have discussed foster cellular discriminator foster cellular discriminator is a widely used uh, fm demodulator circuit it is used in fm radio receiver it is used in satellite uh, station receiver okay uh, foster cellular discriminator is highly linear it provides a uh, very highly linear output but uh, unfortunately it doesn't provide amplitude limiting okay then we have seen ratio detector in case of ratio detector uh, we uh, it is very widely used circuit it is used in tv receivers okay and we know tv is so frequently used uh, gadget in our homes and uh, simultaneously your ratio detector also provides amplitude limiting so since amplitude limiting is a part of a detector circuit so it provides us cost saving we need not use amplitude limiter circuit separately okay so when we use high linearity then we go for foster cellular discriminator if we want to go for you can say uh, price saving we can go for ratio detector and then the last one that is your pll uh, which is the you can say high performance uh, um, demodulator uh, circuit for fm okay it provides great performance against noise it is highly linear as well and obviously in a way we can say that it is almost free from distortion distortion so that's why we always uh, try to prefer phase loop loop circuit for fmd modulation and added to this these uh, pll they are available in the form of ic so obviously whenever some circuit is available in the form of ic then the circuit will be very very compact we will have not have to use inductors uh, that makes our cir circuit bulky okay uh, as we had to use inductors transformers in our slope detector your uh, foster cellular discriminator and ratio detector so all those things are saved in pll so this was a small comparison of various fmd modulators we have discussed in our syllabus so i hope uh, it has further clarified your concepts on fm demodulation next so uh, we have uh, uh, also talked about uh, uh, the narrow band and wide band fm when we uh, discussed the basic concept of frequency modulation uh, just few more things you need to know here that uh, in fm you know that uh, the bandwidth is uh, proportional to your modulation index if your modulation index is having large value uh, there is uh, a more bandwidth requirement in case of fm signal okay and uh, you know that the modulation index for your fm is nothing but uh, your delta upon fm this was your modulation index for uh, fm signal okay so the maximum per permissible deviation in case of fm is 75 kilohertz so 
this maximum deviation that is allowed is 75 kilohertz because uh, we cannot uh, increase this deviation uh, without any bound okay otherwise it will uh, demand uh, more bandwidth okay so if maximum deviation is 75 kilohertz your modulating signal frequencies uh, range from 30 hertz to 15 kilohertz okay according to that your modulation index ranges from 5 to 2500 in case of your fm so if we want to now distinguish between narrow band fm and wide band fm i told you earlier also when our modulation index is near unity we call it as narrow band when it exceeds unity it is your wide band fm okay so uh, in case of narrow band fm your bandwidth requirement is very less as compared to wide band fm in wide band fm uh, bandwidth requirement is almost 15 times as compared to your narrow band fm so your narrow band fm is normally used for fm mobile communication services your police ambulance cabs etc so for communication purpose narrow band fm is used and we use wide band fm for entertainment broadcasting okay and uh, why do we do that so because of uh, you know wide bandwidth uh, obviously it will have large deviation the deviation will be large in case of wide band fm and because of large deviation the noise will be better suppressed okay so because of that uh, this wide band fm is used for your entertainment broadcasting so this was again a brief uh, uh, discussion about your narrow band fm and wide band fm next so students uh, i hope you have understood the concept of narrow band and uh, uh, broad wide band fm now uh, i'll come to uh, last topic of uh, today's class uh, that is uh, your noise and your frequency modulation okay so see from the day one in frequency modulation we are talking about that your fm is very uh, immune to noise okay or distortion of uh, uh, fm signal due to noise is very very some small as compared to your amplitude modulation so that's why we need to understand this concept and it is very very important also okay so let us see now uh, that how frequency modulation signal or fm signal provides us immunity against noise so we have listened time and again that your fm is uh, much more immune to noise as compared to your am and fm we will see that so before that you need to understand that uh, the noise affects us only when uh, noise falls within the pass band of the receiver so obviously uh, noise is spread over large frequency range so if we have a receiver and uh, if some noise falls in the pass band of the receiver or the frequency range at which this receiver work only when that noise will affect us otherwise that noise will not affect us so uh, we try to understand the effect of noise onto the carrier by using vectorial approach so uh, see we know that we have a carrier voltage we represent this carrier voltage with the help of carrier vector so this is our carrier vector okay and uh, this dotted line is nothing but our noise vector so obviously we have to assume the noise signal less than our carrier signal only then communication will make sense okay so uh, if your noise signal is much higher than our uh, you can say carrier signal then uh, no communication is possible so here uh, we have deliberately assumed the noise uh, voltage to be lesser than our carrier voltage so see here that your uh, noise voltage uh, it uh, affects the carrier voltage in two ways it affects the amplitude it affects the phase how does it affect the amplitude obviously you can see that when these two vectors vc and vn they are in one line so your vector uh, resultant becomes vc plus vn okay otherwise also if say this is vn voltage and this is vc voltage the resultant is this one so obviously uh, the amplitude of the resultant signal uh, it is uh, changed by the amplitude of the uh, noise signal 
okay so uh, the resultant amplitude keeps on changing uh, as your uh, noise voltage changes fine this is one point another thing is vectorially your noise modulates the carrier in phase also how you see here this phase theta okay so we assume that this uh, uh, noise voltage vector it is rotating at a constant speed angular velocity say omega fine so as i just told you that your carrier voltage it has been amplitude modulated with noise because the amplitude of the resultant it is changing as this noise vector is rotating fine then phase is also changing see this phase theta how does it change i think you must have been able to understand say if uh, my this is noise vector okay so in this case my theta is now this one okay so if my noise vector is uh, here okay then the resultant will be this one so then in that case my uh, theta or the phase it becomes like this so what we have uh, as your uh, noise voltage vector it uh, uh, rotates at a constant angular frequency then it changes the amplitude as well as the uh, phase of uh, the resultant signal okay and the maximum deviation in the amplitude it will be how much it is vn when they will be in one line vc plus vn and the maximum phase deviation will take place when your uh, uh, noise vector it is at 90 degree of your carrier voltage so if it is at 90 degree then obviously your maximum phase deviation will take place at 90 degree and it will be equal to sin inverse vn upon vc so this is the maximum deviation in the phase okay and now we know that your am receiver uh sorry there is some mistake in this slide so your am receiver will not be affected by phase change not the amplitude change okay so we have just seen that your noise voltage it changes the amplitude as well as the phase of the carrier okay in case of am receiver phase changes will not affect because am receiver will be affected by amplitude changes only and in case of fm receiver we will not be bothered by amplitude change because amplitude change will not affect the performance of fm receiver only the phase change will affect the performance of fm receiver because phase and frequency are related okay so if we keep this thing in mind then uh, we now uh, move forward that in case of am receiver uh, am receiver will be affected only by amplitude change and fm receiver will be affected only by phase change fine this is one point so uh, now let us move to another point that how actually fm provides noise immunity that we need to understand see if you remember in case of amplitude modulation our modulation index was vm by vc so this is modulating signal voltage this is carrier voltage okay so what does it mean that the modulation index of am it was affected only by the amplitudes of the modulating signal and carrier okay uh, there was no effect on the modulation index of the frequency of the noise or the frequency of the modulating signal okay so we can say that the changes in the frequency of noise and the frequency of modulating signal it does not affect snr snr means signal to noise ratio okay whereas in case of frequency modulation picture is quite different and in what way it is different if you remember the modulation index of fm it is equal to delta upon fm and what is fm fm is modulating signal frequency okay the modulation index of fm signal is inversely proportional to modulating signal frequency 
okay means as the frequency of the modulating signal changes the modulation index changes and obviously if the modulation index changes then percentage modulation changes if percentage modulation changes obviously the behavior of that modulation scheme changes so we have one additional thing in frequency modulation and that is that in case of frequency modulation your modulation index is dependent on the frequency also and what is that dependency that we need to note here okay see in case of am uh, i have drawn one graph here on the left hand side this graph or figure is known as noise triangle okay what does it mean it says that the noise output from the receiver try to understand this thing noise output from the receiver if we have a receiver obviously at the input of the receiver we will have signal as well as noise this is my receiver okay and at the output also what we want my signal should be uh, high and my noise should be low at the output of the receiver in fm that is frequency modulation what happens this noise output we want noise at the output at its minimum okay in case of am this minimum was dependent only on the amplitude of the signal but in case of fm the noise output from the receiver it decreases this noise output decreases with the noise sideband frequency noise sideband frequency what does it mean here this is frequency axis okay you look at this triangle in this triangle as you decrease the frequency as you decrease the frequency the noise output is coming down look at this thing carefully as you decrease the frequency your noise output from the receiver is coming down this is one very peculiar thing in case of frequency modulation whereas in case of amplitude modulation as you decrease the frequency as you decrease the frequency of the noise the distribution for am it remains constant there is no effect on the am by change in the frequency of noise this is known as noise triangle that is in case of frequency modulation we have triangular noise distribution which means that the noise output it decreases with noise sideband frequency fine and uh, you can see here that if you assume it as right angle triangle so it will uh, come out to be 1 by uh, root 3 or if you take this as uh, uh, obtain the value of uh, this so we find that an increase of 3 is to 1 in the snr for fm as compared to your am so in case of fm 3 uh, is to 1 increase in snr is observed as compared to am this is known as noise triangle and because of this your uh, noise performance of fm signal uh, is better as compared to am because of this uh, noise triangle concept okay i hope all of you have been able to understand this so after looking into the triangle distribution uh, noise distribution for fm now let us move forward so here uh, last point that we can say here is that in case of fm the noise distribution in, is in the form of uh, triangle whereas in case of am the noise is distributed in the form of rectangle okay so Uh, here uh, one more thing uh, uh, i wanted to uh, explain here uh, that uh, in case of fm 
uh, we are saying that obviously uh, signal to noise ratio uh, improves uh, uh, with the you know frequency in case of your fm so we have uh, see we have defined modulation index for fm is equal to delta upon fm okay delta is the frequency deviation so obviously if we have large value of modulation index means if our frequency deviation is high okay if deviation is high then your signal to noise ratio is also high it is better but if we have a large deviation then bandwidth requirement also becomes large so obviously uh, if we want to improve on the signal to noise ratio then we have to lose in terms of bandwidth and if we want to save bandwidth we'll have to you know trade off in terms of signal to noise ratio okay so that is the meaning of uh, trade off between your uh, bandwidth and snr means we will be able to get one uh, at the cost of uh, another okay and that has become possible only and only due to uh, this uh, your uh, noise triangle uh, concept of uh, fm which was not possible in case of your amplitude modulation okay so you can see here that uh, your bandwidth requirement your snr performance it depends on the frequency of the signal as well as the frequency of the uh, noise okay so as i told you that with increase in the deviation of the signal we will be able to uh, you know improve snr performance okay or with increase in uh, delta your bandwidth requirement will also increase uh, obviously if we want more and more uh, or better and better snr performance we can think of improving uh, or increasing more and more value of deviation but uh, we are not allowed to increase the maximum deviation and bandwidth beyond a certain limit okay uh, because we have communications from uh, other service providers or other users also so a single user cannot be uh, allowed to increase the deviation beyond certain point and similarly the bandwidth requirement cannot be uh, allowed to increase indefinitely okay so that is another important point another point is that in case of phase modulation we know that uh, phase modulation and frequency modulation they are related to each other okay so uh, in case of phase modulation also your uh, carrier uh, voltage is constant so pm also has the noise immunity properties of fm but in pm the concept of noise triangle is not there okay so this noise triangle concept exists only and only in your uh, frequency modulation Uh, which says that uh, your uh, snr uh, performance or you can say noise output decreases with the decrease in the frequency okay so uh, in that way your uh, frequency modulation is uh, better than uh, your pm also so your fm is better than pm as well as uh, your uh, uh, am in terms of your noise immunity because in case of pm uh, as the noise and modulating frequencies are lower uh, there is no improvement because in phase modulation uh, your modulation index is uh, the maximum value of the phase change not the frequency okay there is one um, more uh, one more important point here see if you look at the maximum uh, uh, frequency here in these two uh, figures you see that if there is some f1 frequency okay we have this much noise output and uh, if we have uh, say some another f2 frequency okay we have uh, this much output fine so uh, uh, that means like uh, if we increase the value of the uh, deviation then uh, your uh, noise output further decreases so for a constant value of the deviation as your uh, uh, noise sideband frequencies decrease your uh, noise output follows triangle dis distribution and apart from that if you increase the deviation the overall uh, uh, noise uh, performance is also improved okay so th no see this is also a triangle but the peak value of the noise in this uh, uh, 
uh, triangle is much lower uh, if your deviation has changed. Fine. So this was your relationship between your uh, noise and FM. Next. So this is the last concept of today's class. And with that, your frequency uh, modulation uh, part will also be uh, over. So here, uh, uh, what I want to say here that we have seen in the noise triangle that your noise has a greater effect on uh, uh, higher modulating uh, frequency. See, uh, as we increase the frequency, as the in increase the frequency, your noise output is increasing. Okay, what does it mean? That noise has a greater effect on higher modulating frequency. Okay, so obviously when we have modulating signal frequency, it we have a range of modulating signal frequencies. In the, uh, you know, say uh, speech uh, frequency, we have frequencies varies from uh, 300 Hertz to 3.4 kilohertz. Okay, so our speech frequency, it varies from 300 hertz to 3.4 kilohertz. So what does it mean? That these higher frequencies, they will be more affected by the noise and these lower frequencies, they will be less affected by the noise due to noise triangle. Fine. So uh, what does it mean that the high frequencies, they are more prone to noise? Means the high frequencies, they are, uh, you know, weak to fight noise in the channel. Okay, so if we want to save our uh, uh, high frequency uh, components from uh, noise, then what we do, we can artificially boost them at the transmitter side. Means our high frequencies, they are not that weak, uh, sorry, they are not that strong, they are weak. We want to make them strong artificially. Okay, they are not actually strong. We will make them strong artificially, means we will artificially boost the level of those frequencies at the transmitter side. And since we have made them artificially strong, they will travel through the channel after getting strong. But at the receiver side, we want them in the original form. So at the receiver side, we will restore them in their original amplitude. Okay, and this artificial boosting of high frequency components of our signal is known as pre-emphasis. Okay, so the high frequency components of the modulating signal, which are more prone to noise, they will be artificially boosted at the transmitter side according to some predefined curve. Okay, then after getting artificially boosted, they will be able to uh, tackle the channel in a better way. They will be able to uh, tackle the noise in the channel in a better way. And when they reach back at the receiver side, we will restore them by applying the reverse of the artificially boosting curve. Means we will apply the compensation at the receiver side. So whatever effect we had artificially included in our signal, at the transmitter side, at the receiver side, we will restore them, okay? So this artificial process of boosting the signal at the transmitter side is known as pre-emphasis. So here you see, as the frequency is increasing, we have artificially boosted their amplitude. At the receiver side, we will apply the reverse of that and we will restore our original signal back. So. This is known as pre-emphasis and de-emphasis. And because of this pre-emphasis and de-emphasis, our uh, performance of uh, modulating signal uh, further improves. Uh, here we again use the concept of noise triangle uh, uh, in, and utilize the performance of uh, FM against your noise. So I hope uh, all of you have been able to understand the concept of noise triangle and this uh, pre-emphasis and uh, de-emphasis. Okay, and uh, with this, uh, our topic of FM is uh, over and we have looked into the details and advantages of uh, your uh, frequency uh, modulation with respect to your amplitude modulation and your uh, 
uh, phase modulation. So uh, you all know, uh, and you can justify uh, the use of FM over uh, or advantages of FM over your AM and uh, PM. Okay. So that's all for today's class. We will continue in the next class.